see inside your eye with that same eye part three have you ever seen a glimpse of branching lines in your vision perhaps while your ophthalmologist was shining a light in your eye what you saw might have been the shadows of blood vessels on the surface of your retina in this video i describe some of the history and science of this phenomenon and show how to get remarkably stable and detailed views i also briefly describe two other related phenomena in 1819, the Czech physician Johannes Purkinje described moving a candle in the peripheral view of his eye and seeing the shadows of the major blood vessels on the retina. In place of a candle, I suggest you use a AAA mini mag light in candle mode. Do this in a dimly lit room facing a blank wall. Hold a hand over one eye and stare directly ahead with your other eye while moving the light in arcs or circles in your peripheral vision. You should see a branching figure which rapidly fades from view if you stop moving the light. In 1825, Purkinjeid published a variation on his original method in which he focused a spot of sunlight onto the white of the eye. A safer way of doing this is to hold a red LED against the corner of your closed eye and move the light in small circles. So why do we see these shadows at all, and why do they fade? Purkinje did not answer these questions, but in 1830, the English scientist Charles Wheatstone, in a review of Purkinje's work, noted that the blood vessels are semi-transparent and suggested that normally the photoreceptors on the retina adjust for the decreased light levels underneath the vessels. But when the shadows move, the photoreceptors required a little time to readjust. You can easily see that your flesh is translucent, so it is reasonable to believe that a very thin layer, blood vessels included, would be transparent. But why would the shadow of the semi-transparent blood vessel fade out, but not the image of something you are looking at as it stays focused on one location on the retina? The answer is, both fade when they don't move. It is just that normally the vessel shadows don't move, and normally the focused images do move. This is because our eyes are constantly making small movements called microsaccades. These movements are why we experience some visual illusions as moving. We simply can't keep our eyes still enough. If we could keep our eyes perfectly still, so even the focused image of something we were looking at did not move on the retina, the image would fade. We would go blind. However, you can easily keep your eyes still enough to experience the disappearance of this large fuzzy ring in your peripheral vision by staring at the central red dot. Because of the ring's fuzzy edges and our lack of peripheral acuity, the microsaccades our eyes make automatically are not enough to keep the image of the ring from fading. This is called Troxler fading after the Swiss physician Ignaz Troxler, who wrote about this phenomenon in 1804. Wheatstone also noted the appearance of a crescent-shaped shadow and suggested this may be due to the slight depression in the center of the retina, an area called the fovea. You should see this easily as you make circles with the light. In 1854, the German ophthalmologist Karl Burrow published a drawing of his view of this crescent-shaped shadow, and in 1855, the German anatomist Heinrich Müller wrote that both the crescent shadow and the shadows of the blood vessels are formed by light from the image of the candle flame formed on the interior of the eye, sort of like having a light source within the eye itself. The crescent may not be entirely due to the depression in the retina, but may also be due to the lower sensitivity the photoreceptors have to light coming from the side, something called the Stiles-Crawford effect after the investigators who first wrote about it in 1933. In 1867, the French magician and inventor Robert Houdin described a device he made called the retinoscope. This is the earliest device that was named that I am aware of for seeing the shadows of blood vessels on the retina. It worked by focusing light on the white of the eye, the sclera, as suggested by Purkinje in 1825. In 1996, researchers David Coppola and Dale Purvis 
described a motor-driven light source they used which shone light through the closed eyelid onto the sclera. The Exploratorium in San Francisco has an exhibit where visitors can move a light manually on their own closed eyes. In 1926, the ophthalmologist E.P. Fortin described a device he built consisting of a hollow drum containing black velvet and an electric light that could be rotated around the drum. I built a much smaller version. See my article in Make Magazine for construction details. In 1922, Dr. S.I. Eber suggested the name auto-ophthalmoscopy for having patients view their retinal blood vessel shadows and encouraged others to start investigating possible clinical applications. The ophthalmologist Leslie Drews thought the term autofundoscopy would be more appropriate and suggested inducing an afterimage of an eccentric cross to allow more quantitative descriptions by patients of retinal lesions. In the pulsating vascular tree and optic phenomenon, you see just the arteries, and you see these pulsating. The French physician and botanist Francois lacroix Bossier de Savages wrote about this in 1757 and again in a book in 1763, which was published in French in 1772. The English polymath Thomas Young wrote about this in 1793, and the English physician James Jago published a drawing in 1864. The German physiologist Leonard Landoy called this entoptische Pulserscheinung, which translates entoptical pulse appearance. The suggested explanations for this phenomenon are that the arteries expand and contract with your pulse, which moves the retina, causing a sensation of light and changing the shape of the artery shadow, making it visible. The French physicist Edme Marriott reported on his discovery of the blind spot in 1668, but it wasn't until the 1800s that attempts were made to determine the exact shape and size of the blind spot. In 1840, the German anatomy professor Alexander Friedrich von Hoek published a drawing of the extent of the blind spot showing the stubs of the larger blood vessels, and in 1867, the German physician and physicist Hermann von Hemholtz published a similar drawing and noted that you could locate blood vessels some distance from the blind spot. Dr. John Evans did just that in the early 1900s and published a book in 1938 on clinical applications of this technique of mapping what are often called angioscotomas. See the following references for more information. Stay tuned for future videos. The next one will be on Purkinje's blue arcs, which I consider the most beautiful and interesting thing there is to see inside your eye with that same eye.